sir. If there's any officers, so we'll have a 30 seconds. Good evening, Sergeant Calagero. During the next 40 minutes, we're going to go over the history of the 15th Field Artillery Regiment, the Royal Regiment of Canadian Artillery. Next slide, please. But before we begin, I want to ask everybody, and this is a trick question, how old will our unit be on our next birthday? Ask Walter Switzer. Sorry? Perfect. Next slide, please. Because our birthday was two days ago. We're 101, and our next birthday will be 102. So we've served for more than a century. Now, to tell the story of, the, of this regiment, you have to go back to before it was formed with the 68th uh, Battery of the um, Canadian Field Artillery. This was a depot battery that was located in Vancouver. Uh, what this battery did is it trained a, a a bunch of gunners uh, as artillerymen and as recruits and got them ready to go overseas to deploy uh, uh, in the Western Front and in other areas they were needed as gunners. And they were um, all under a Captain Borman and locally they became known as Borman's Artillery. Okay, next slide. Now here they are recruiting uh, down on Granville Street in 1917. You see your cap badge. See the horse in the window, plastic horse. Uh, the young man there is a, a Boy Scout. And this is what they would do. They would train these huge drafts of gunners to deploy uh, overseas. This, this is the number 10 and 11 overseas draft on January 1917. Here they are going down gravel Street. In 1916, they were using the 18-pounder, the quick-firing 18-pounder, which we have one of over there, it was pulled at that time by a team of six horses. And there you have a couple of officers in the front. Okay. Gun detachment commander, here's sergeant with the gun on top. Okay, they didn't, they didn't pull the, they were, aside from the, uh, the actual gun and uh, limber and, and the horses that were pulling it. Routine of training. They, they, they trained, they had to eat, they had to make time for, for themselves. Here's just some uh, um, four soldiers on horseback from the 68th Depot Battery. Excellent horsemen, okay? You have, you have to maintain yourself, you have to maintain your horse and your horses. Okay, they're shoeing horses. Uh, what, um, they, they were trained at Hastings Park, where the PE is now. Again, excellent horsemen. I think I've seen this in the junior ranks mess after some really good parties. Okay. Uh, excellent with the lasso again, experts with horses. Peeling potatoes, the routine of training, meals, etc. Camaraderie. Here you have a, an officer. This would not be Captain Borman. He's missing a uh, hip here. And, and with dog. In 1917. Okay. Gun, a gun with a spade, the spade dug in. It's always time for a snow, good snowball fight with the gunners. Okay, 1917. This is that exhibition uh, park, or uh, again, Hastings Park. Now, this type of a flag, like this, or with a triangle, indicates a headquarters. All right, a headquarters. So. There was the 15th Brigade Canadian Field Artillery Canadian Expeditionary Force prior to the formation of this unit. Its headquarters was mobilized at Vancouver on 15 April 1916. That's just the headquarters. Okay, they had the gunners here, they were training, they formed the headquarters. It went on with the 15th Field Artillery Regiment in Europe, um, in France and Flanders, as a unit of the 5th Canadian Division Artillery from 20 March to 4 April 1917. On 4 April 1917, it was disbanded. So we start to see 6 8 batteries. We start to see 15 field prior to the unity form. Now, 
to, to tell one of our key things with our regiment is the history of the 6th Battery that was formed as part of the 16th Brigade Canadian Field Artillery for the North Russia Expedition Force. It was organized at Whitley in August 1918 under the command of Major W.C. Hyde. And we're going to get into more of the details, but it left Dundee, Scotland on the 21st of September 1918, arrived at Archangel 1 October 1918, and returned to England 18 June 1919. Okay, here's a map of the globe, of the globe okay? Well, of Europe anyway. Uh, Dundee, or, uh, it left Dundee, Scotland, went around uh, Sweden, Norway, around here, Finland. Finland, came around, landed at Archangel. Right. Now, they had a Captain O.A. Moet and his battery uh, who were in support of the American and white Russian forces at Shenkursk when they were attacked by a strong force of Bolsheviks. Captain Moet was mortally wounded. Um, he was wounded. They tried, they tried getting him into a med aid station on a, on a sled. He died on the way there. Okay, his medals are right here. This is Captain Amon Moore of the 68th Battery Canadian Field Artillery. He, uh, he received the uh, military cross. Okay, we will talk more about him as we go to the next portion. Now, the only real way to tell this story is by reading a couple of paragraphs. So I want you to follow the map. We'll go through the map here as I read this, these. Uh, it's the best way I found to tell the story of the 68th Battery. So here, here's our map. Archangel, Yesmer River, uh, Tolgas, the North Eva River, the South Eva River, Shenkers, okay. Olga River, and Yesma River. This is an extraction from the honor shield that's up on the wall. Hope we've all had a chance to read it. For the State Battery's history. Captain Mowat, Military Cross, six field battery, Canadian field artillery in North Russia, and then with the 18 pounders right there. All right, so they were part of the 16th Brigade, Canadian field artillery. They were formed on the 3rd of August, 1918. All right, and here's their story. In 1917, during a critical phase of World War I, the Allies were suddenly faced with the prospect of losing one of their member nations. From 1914 to 1917, Russia had effectively tied up many German divisions on a bitter war in the Eastern Front. However, the Russian Revolution of 1917 and the Civil War that followed, rapidly reducing the effectiveness of the Tsar's army. The Tsar was the king. Okay, that's why you call it Tsar in Russia. March of 1918 was marked by the signing of a peace treaty between Russia and Germany, and it wasn't long before large numbers of German troops began moving west to deal with the Allies on the Western Front. They were freed up here, and they moved many divisions to where the Allies were, Canada, United Kingdom, France, and other countries. They were here, Belgium, and into France. So they moved all these divisions over here to deal with the Canadians and, and the Allies. Faced with the new threat of massive German reinforcements on the Western Front, the Allies quickly dispatched a special force to Archangel and Murmansk in northern Russia. The purpose of the force was to continue to engage German troops in the east, as well as to aid white Russians in the civil war against the Red Russians, the Bolsheviks. Bolshevik. Uh, it was the whites versus the Reds. The whites were loyal to the Tsar. A number of Canadians were included in the Allied force that landed in Russia in June of that year. On the 3rd of August, 1918, Canada was asked to provide uh, two batteries of field artillery to support elements of the North Russia Expeditionary Force. That date saw the establishment of the 16th Brigade of Canadian Field Artillery consisting of a brigade of headquarters and two batteries of 18-pounder field guns. 18-pounders right over there and it's on that wall. Made up of carefully chosen gunners, the 67th Battery and commanded by Major F.F. F. Arnoldi and the 68th Battery commanded by Major Walter C. Hyde. The 16th Brigade Canadian Field Artillery was under the command of Colonel C.H.L. Sharman. 
especially selected Canadian troops were, they did, they did, I read this somewhere else, they chose Canadian soldiers who had were experienced with bitter cold, okay, because uh, where they were going. Shortly after arriving in Archangel, the brigade was split into several small groups. The 67th Battery moved south along the Giga River. and established itself at the village of Tonga. The 68th Battery was split between Shemford and the Esma River. Area, this area here, approximately 150 miles south of Archangel. During the course of the next few weeks, all of the 68th Battery detachments or subdivisions, as they were known, distinguished themselves in a series of hard-fought engagements. The gunners stationed along the Esma provided fire support for such diverse units as the 339th Regiment of Infantry American and the French Foreign Legion. At Schenkertz on 19 January 1919, a strong Bolshevik force attacked the Allied, Allied position and the gunners of the 68th Battery. From a position on top of a bluff, nine gunners and a lieutenant successfully stopped wave after wave of Russian infantry who for two days attempted to overrun the American position. Shortly after this action, the battery captain and one gunner were killed while deploying an 18 pounder in a sniping gun roll. One captain and a gunner, that's the captain. By the end of January 1919, it had become obvious that the Shenkirk position could not be held for it was virtually surrounded by Bolshevik troops. Without enough horses to tow all of the 18 pounders, the gunners were forced to destroy all but one of the guns. The withdrawal was successful, and the 68th soon rejoined the rest of the battery in Kitsa. The much reduced battery continued to provide support, and in the words of one American observer, this is what he said, once more the Canadians provide, provided their uncalculable value to the expedition thoroughly discouraging the vanguard of the Soviet pursuit with some splendid open site marksmanship. That's direct fire, okay, open site. From February to April, the battery fought several engagements in the Kitsa area. Its firepower strengthened by the timely addition of a 4.5 inch howitzer and a 60, pound, a 60 pounder, both up on the wall. We'll look at these later. But by May, the war office had begun to withdraw the North Russia force. The war was over. The Allies had defeated the Central Powers and there seemed little point in continuing to fight the Bolshevik government. Consequently, on 11 June 1919, the 16th Brigade, Canadian Field Artillery, sailed from Britain follow, following a final parade at Archangel. The day was marked with the presentation of Russian medals and a farewell tribute from the Force Commander in Chief. Another quote Over and over again, the Canadian Field Artillery had saved the force from destruction. Lieutenant G.Y.L. Crosley, a future officer and commanding officer of the 15th Vancouver Coast Regiment, he became RCO later, was awarded the Russian Order of St. Stanislas, third class, for his part in the campaign. So ended the 68th Battery's unusual contribution to the First World War. The battery was perpetuated as part of the 15th Field Brigade until May 1939, the beginning of the Second World War, at which time it was redesignated the 9th Anti-Aircraft Battery of the 1st Anti-Aircraft Regiment, RCA. They're all up on that wall. On, first, on 1 September 1970, the 209th Field Battery of the 15th Field Artillery Regiment was redesignated the 68th Field Battery. So from 1939 to 1970, 68th Battery did exist, but it wasn't manned. Since 1970 to present, we have 68th Battery here and 3-1 Battery. Right now, 3-1 Battery is not manned. So for the last uh, 51 years, 68th Battery has existed as it did before. Okay, this is from Library, Library and Archives Canada. This is the members of 68th Battery with two Bolshevik prisoners of war. Okay, good hardy Canadian. Here, here's a bigger picture of it. Okay, there are prisoners of war. Here are the Bolshevik. And what did the Canadians do? Well, they took their furry hats and wore them. And they gave the Bolsheviks Canadian hats. Artillery cap, as you can see. All in good spirits, they stop fighting. They're our friends now. It's a good Canadian thing to do. 
Here's a 68 battery Canadian fuel artillery in Ru uh, Russia in World War I. Um, like a church here and a cemetery. Okay. Notice, I, I, it just struck me how thin these, you know, loosened layers, lots of loosened layer clothing, it looks pretty thin to me. So again, they were carefully selected for um, being experienced with bitter cold conditions. Now, we're gonna watch a film here of this, remember, the 68th battery and 67th battery were part of the 16th brigade, 16th brigade. But there's a researcher, and it's actually a descendant, um, Sergeant Bolgak, who could read Russian, read what we're gonna see here. It, he's, it says it's the son of this uh, acting bombardier Deep Fraser who goes to look for his, his uh, father's grave. It's, the mask isn't quite right. Likely his grandson. He's going there looking for his father's grave. Looks like he's brought his daughter. And they're gonna look at the area where uh, 68th Battery was. And there's a guy dressed like a Bolshevik with him. He's got a rifle. Okay, so it's a short film from, uh, uh, from uh, Facebook. Returned after the First World War, there was a committee formed called the Otter Committee. 
under, I believe, a, a colonel or a general, and they wanted to see how they could best utilize all the trained soldiers that were coming back from overseas where Canada was lacking in, in armories or certain trades for the military. So it was called the Otter Commission. So from this Otter Commission, a group of 11 artillery officers recently returning from Europe met to discuss the creation of a militia artillery regiment in Vancouver. The results of this meeting were worked into the recommendations of the Otter Committee. And on the 2nd of February, 1920, the government of Canada authorized the creation of the 15th Brigade Canadian Field Artillery. That's when we 50 field and 68 batteries merged into the unit starting in 1920. This is what they had. Uh, they had, they included 3-1 battery, 6-8 battery, and 8-5 battery, 6-8, and they had the 18-pounder, again over there, and the 5th feet battery had a larger gun that fired, it was a, a breech-loading 60-pounder, the round in those years, some of them were uh, used in the imperial system, they went by the weight of the projectile. So that was a much larger gun. Now, this is the first home of the newly formed 50th Brigade Canadian Field Artillery. This is, uh, came, this was uh, uh, the horse show building. It was built in 1909 for horse shows. Okay. Uh, the government bought it and turned it into an armory for several units. One of them was, was our unit. It's on George, it was on Georgia Street and Alberta Street. Um, so it was a regula had a regulation rink size, rink in it for horse shows and, and viewing bosses and and I remember reading the military changed the color of it. They made it green and black, and everyone thought it was disgusting in the, in the lower in Vancouver at the time. All these kinds of stories when you get into this. Okay, so this is a, the Stanley Park Armory, right on Georgia Street, across from uh, Stanley Park. Uh, so here is it says it's the fifth. It, it says it's the uh, fifth medium battery, but they're supposed to have you know the sixty pounders. So um, they may have taken these guns or whatever, but they were downtown. They would ride up to Hastings Park for their training. And it talked about how in 1928, how they had to rent these trucks. I know the horses weren't available, and they rented the trucks to do this thing about you know, hauling guns around with trucks rather than horses. It was very uh, uh, new. Here's a better picture. And uh, so the, the fifth battery of the 15th Brigade became one of the first Canadian militia artillery units to experiment for towing guns with vehicles at that time, right? The same picture is just taken at a different angle. Here they are coming out of the armory. This is the limber. You can imagine it wasn't a very sweet ride. No shock, wood, wooden and iron wheels sitting on uh, maybe a, just a seat they're holding on, on cobblestone roads going all the way up from downtown to the p &E. okay? This is the inside of the Horseshoe Building or later the Stanley Park Armory. Again, it had a viewing, a, a, an arena, this was for horse shows, it had seating, uh, maybe uh, boxes here for guests. Again, it, it was just repurposed by the military. They're currently playing uh, tennis in there at that time when this was taken. And now this is a little later, 1941. There was the, were the Irish Fusiliers in that armory. They were infantry. Looks like they have a bunch of kids here ready for something, uh, maybe to deploy. Um, again, another, just another view of of the uh, horseshoe building. They had all this kid up in the stands too. Now, we want to talk about the armory here, the best for armory. This is Lieutenant Colonel Perry. Lieutenant Colonel Perry was an architect and he was also the commanding officer of the 15th Field Artillery Regiment from 1930 to 1934. He designed this armory while he was a CO. Okay. Um, Today we look at that as kind of conflict, but it's a very interesting story. It was built by this firm called uh, Smith Brothers and Wilson from 1932 to 1934, and it cost $130,000 for a cavalry or armored and artillery unit, two units in this armory. Now, we'll look at some pictures of the armory being constructed from 1932 to 1934. This is on November 6, 1932. Uh, you know where you guys are, That's, this is the compound, right? Here's the front. Uh, officers Mills balcony front entrance. Sweet, <laughs> we don't know where it went. It was nice to have it out there. This is the inside of the armory. Right now we're sitting about here. 
There's a truck way down there being constructed, lots of windows. Outside the Armory, and it was officially opened by the Earl of Besro on the 27th of March, 1934. Held by the vintage of the car. Notice how small these trees are out front. And now they're quite, quite the size. Now, um, all of, for the last 20 years, we've put all the history out on the Armory so that everyone can see the history. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Perry, the architect, he has pictures right by the orderly room door. You can see it there, okay? We put it there with a caption of what who he was and what he did for a job and how he built this armory. This is the Earl of Bespro. He is right next to the front entrance, the little tunnel there. His name was Barry Rabazon Ponsonby. Very interesting name. He was the ninth Earl of Bespro. And he lived from 27 October, or from 27 October to 1880 to 10 March, 1956. He served as a, the Governor General of Canada, the 14th since Confederation. In those years, the Governor General of Canada was not a Canadian. It was like a British Lord or something that was appointed, okay? So here he is, the name, this armory is named for him and, and for his title. Now, this is during the opening of the armory. It says it's the opening, but we know it was 1934. Vancouver Archives uh, had that in there, but that's, that's cool. Here's the front entrance. This is, this is, uh, during the opening, they're putting on a display. This is a 60 pounder. This is the front entrance where you guys walk along going to the computer lab and, and uh, what uh, Bruce's office entrance. Here, those four tunnels are where they kept the guns. They had sliding doors in and sliding doors out. And you can see them here. But I kind of looked at this for a while, but it looks like a, a Bravo, a B sub call sign, or a B gun. Right in the army, taken right looking that way. Now, just kind of a fun picture. This is what the officer's mess look, rather the warrants and sergeant's mess looked like just after it was opened. Uh, notice the detail. A lot of pride in, in artillery and a lot of pride in the unit. See the grenade? There and there. The zigzag, artillery zigzag, another grenade. Notice the grenade on top of the curtain rail. Zigzag again. There's a, a German World War I souvenir, German helmet, rather a, a German helmet from World War I. Some Canadian ones, another German one. So we still have the same chairs. Now, let's talk about the band. The band of the 50th Field Artillery Regiment, 1934 to present. Now, the band was formed in 1934, 20 years after the establishment of the regiment, and just after it moved into the Besboro Armory. Okay, so the band joined us uh, when, we, when the unit was already here, and we're part of the unit. Here's the regiment uh, performing, uh, performing in front of the Farland buildings in Ottawa, and they do more than 100 engagements annually. That's why there's there somebody you want to point out here? Perfect, good shot. Okay. Um, in 2000, the band was relocated to Garrison, uh, to Garrison headquarters, to the Garrison headquarters building near Jericho Beach on English Bay, and later to the major General Hoffmeister building at the corner of West First and Burrard, where they are today. Now, the unit uh, changed its name a little bit, became the 15th Field Brigade Royal Canadian Artillery, the Royal Regiment of Canadian Artillery, from 1935 to 1939. 1939, war is looming again. The, the unit got re-rolled from field artillery to coast artillery because there was a need to protect the, the coast and protect the logistics and everything and a lot of other reasons. We have the largest uh, port uh, in North America, the Port of Vancouver, and war was coming. So they had a reroll to coast artillery. Now, there was a brigade headquarters. The batteries had to change the 31st, 58th, and 85th heavy batteries of the 50th Vancouver Coast Brigade were placed on active service on the 1st of September, 1939, command coastal defenses in and about Vancouver. They were put into forts. We'll look at a fort in a moment, what they are. Canada declared war on Germany on the 10th of September, 1939. It was the first and only time it has declared war on another country on its own. Now remember, the unit had already mobilized nine days before. They were already in the fort, manning the guns, well in advance of uh, uh, Canada during war. It was, we were one of the first actually deployed, you know, uh, ready for war. Uh, we were called the, the uh, Vancouver Coast Brigade later, later down to a regiment. 
Now, this armor, remember, two, two units, right? Armor or cavalry. They really did have horses in those years, too, cavalry. The British Columbia Hussars, that's the crest over the other door. British Columbia Hussars armored car. They started, it was B Squadron that was in the building. What happened? They had to convert because there was a need for, for searchlights, so they became artillery, okay? And they formed, they had three batteries of, of searchlights, and they became the first searchlight regiment from 1939 to uh, 10 September 1940. That's why that crest is there. That's their colors, and it's the first plaque on the top left over there, if you read them. Right below it, it says searchlight. It says this, how they became the first searchlight regiment. So that unit had to re-roll. Now they were artillery. They weren't armored anymore. Now, this is what they were doing. They had to protect, uh, you have to remember, the Navy was on the west coast out there. We had patrol aircraft, maritime patrol aircraft. There were fighter squadrons, squadrons of Comox. Um, so we had lots of layers of protection. Now, in Vancouver, Point Grey, UBC, uh, here we are, Stanley Park, Line State Bridge. So what they did is, is as shipping was coming into the port, they had to stop and be examined. There was a, a north examination vessel, south examination vessel, and they had to come into the uh, uh, examination area. There's a, another examination vessel here, and there's another one later on I'll show you. There was one out uh, rather, yeah, there's three of them here. But the, um, so what would happen is when they were in this area, they were covered. 3-1 battery, heavy, now they were close artillery. They had a gun here at Point Atkinson. Okay, with the searchlight, that's what those dogs are, searchlight. There was a, a fire command post up here, with band. There was guns right underneath the landscape bridge. We'll look at that in, in, the, uh, in the gantry, 31 post again. And then right here at uh, Ferguson Point, at uh, Stanley Park, where the Tea House of Sequoia Grill are. Okay, they had two guns there. Three, one here, here, and here, where the lighthouse is. The 58th Coast Battery was at Point Grey. They had three um, guns there, and they also had a, a gun, NLP, here in Steveson, to cover the river, Fraser River. 58th Coast Steveson. Point great. Remember the, uh, for those of us, for those of you that live in Jericho, I don't know if we have anybody who lives in Jericho. Jericho, okay. Uh, I talked about the seaplane, how oh, they had seaplanes to patrol the air. There, was this, there were two seaplanes in a hangar right on the beach. This is where Jericho is up here. We're right down and there were two seaplanes right below Jericho, right below the port. In a hangar, it's long gone. Okay. The two guns at Stanley Park in early 1938. They were six-inch guns, very heavy. They found they needed them in another location, out on York Island. We'll talk about York Island. So this is at Stanley Park, right? And you can still see these gun rings there. Uh, and there's a plaque with our cap edge on it that identifies that 3-1 battery served there. This is the gantry underneath the Lionsgate Bridge. Two, two 12-pounders. Um, they built this up. They finished building it. Luckily, because under here it flooded the next year. They had problems with flooding, so they, they put them up. There's ammunition storage and, 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 gut, and, and shelters for the gun detachments in this building. So this is the gantry under, uh, this is called Narrows North. Narrows North, underneath the landscape bridge. Now, Point Grey, where UBC is. Um, three six-inch guns, uh, quite a sizable camp. There are, there's an examination down there. there down here is a, a tower beach. There's two searchlights there. I don't think you guys will walk down there. They're all graffitied up. Two of our, our searchlights. And um, that gun was restored a few years ago, less gun. The Museum of Anthropology sits on top of this one and there's a Bill Reed uh, sculpting right in the gun uh, ring. What happened was they couldn't dig up, these were meant to be shells. So they're, they've got layers of concrete, sand to absorb shelling. Rather than trying to dig it out to put it in the museum, they just left it there. Okay, and they built both on top of it. And there's an architecture here. This one here is uh, currently overgrown, but they had a very sizable force here. Okay, if I could have you go back uh, to one more. 
One more. If you're ever going around Stanley Park, right, right about here is a uh, Siwash Rock. Look, look up. If you're coming around this way, before you get to Siwash Rock, look up and you can see the searchlight is sitting there. It's, got, it's part of the trail network. The trail goes right over the top of the searchlight. There's, well, there's a searchlight right there. They have several of them. But that one there, if you're going around, just look the next time you're down at Stanley Park, just before Siwash Rock, to look up and it's up there. Big. Okay, that's our searchlight. Now, this is out at Point Grey, six inch guns, three of them, with a heavy battery, Mark 7 post gun, reach loading. Now, the third battery went to York Island. Let's look at York Island. Look at the big picture. Coast of British Columbia, Vancouver Island. There's York Island in there. Now, what happened was any shipping that came here had to be inspected. It was wartime, protect the protect all of us, protect supplies and everything. Anybody that was coming in had, had, had it was met here. York Island is strategically positioned between Vancouver Island and, and, the, and the, uh, the, main, the main shoreline of British Columbia. It's in a choke point. It was put there for a reason. This is York Island. Notice uh, how our, our affiliation goes up there too. Besborough Bay, kind of neat. So, so here's, here's York Island, Hardwick Island. York Island, Clarence Island, and Fanny Island. We'll look at these in more detail. So everyone that was coming down the coast had a pass by this. They still do today, cruise ships and everything, and they were inspected. Right around the island, uh, we've been there, there's like little rocks jutting out of the, the water, and they call them Artillery Island. Kind of cool, too. Again, the main island of York Island, Clarence Island, and Fanny Island. I'll see them in a second. This is the this is the installation. It's very very heavy. Uh, lots of buildings. Two um, six inch guns that replace the 4.7 inch gun that's again up on the wall uh, that they moved up from Stanley Park. Okay. This is a, just a satellite image, but up there was the 85th post battery of our unit. That's where the third battery went during World War II. Here we are. There's a six inch uh, gun, six inch Mark II on York Island. This is number one gun. Notice the uh, ammunition recesses. We'll see these shortly, where they store the ammunition underneath the gun. And it, it's got good overhead cover. And uh, this is number two gun, same thing. So this is number two gun then. Notice how pristine it is, fairly good condition. There's an actual gun there. Next. And this is number two gun when we visited in 2014. Same overhead cover, <laughs> a little bit of rust. The gun's gone. And we looked right down into the water, and the uh, artillery islets are out there. Okay, that's what I'm um, you, you might recognize all the people that are in here. Uh, Bonder Choi, Lieutenant Purcell, Bonder uh, Underwood, uh, Captain MC, Sergeant, uh, uh, the, the RSN. Thank you. Uh, uh, the RSN. And Bonder Lacamel, he was always smiling on the trip, but we were pretty sure he was up to something. Okay, he was having, he was having a, a good time. Sergeant Hodgson, thank you. Go ahead. Now, this island had three searchlights, general electric searchlights. This is one of them, the cover open. This is the ladder. Okay. A Clarence Island, Fanny Island. That's what they actually look like, right in front of the, uh, and remember, right here on the right is the mainland, the coast. On the left is Vancouver Island. Now, we're going to watch a film about the 85th Heavy Coast Battery on the 85th Coast Battery Fort on York Island. Uh, there's a gunner standing alone in the film. He's wearing the old uniform. His name was Bud Garrett. Bud Garrett. Later on, he'd become our commanding officer. You can see his picture over there. He'd become the CEO of the unit. So uh, the audio is, uh, is challenging, okay? But it's a good film, all right? We, we boosted up the audio since last night. Opposite Kelsey Bay sits York Island. Not that much. A tiny point at the key point. Land that at first glance That's York Island. resembles any other island in the strait. But a closer look reveals a decades-old legacy of World War II preserved on the island. 
York Island is in a very strategic spot. Uh, you would say that it's uh, at the conjunction of Sunderland Channel and Johnston Strait. York Island is a very special little island uh, simply for the reason that it was used as a site of a coastal defense fort during World War II. There are some really fantastic old fort buildings there, and we don't have a lot of that kind of old architecture here on the island. And these buildings are very substantial, and it was really quite a feat of engineering that they even ended up there at all. And Fort York Island Fort is the only island fort that there is on the West Coast. Okay. At number two gun. Starting in about 1937, they sent engineers up from Victoria, and these were military engineers. And they did reconnoitered the island um, and tried to establish where they wanted to put their various gun emplacements and where they would put their observation posts and barracks. Uh, one of the first things that they did was they built a very substantial wharf. Uh, you have to remember that on the coast in those years, uh, water traffic was highly important as a means of communication and transportation. So having this wharf there was very, very critical to building the fort and getting their supplies and their troops in. We're standing in front of where the officers' quarters were, and these are stairs leading up to the officers' quarters. I hear it on the left. This was, this was really a great discovery. It's like an archaeological find because nobody had seen these stairs since the war years. And this is what remains of the officers' quarters. It was once uh, described as a very swank building with a stone fireplace and hardwood floors. And what was interesting about the construction was that when it had a roof, it had an eave that went all the way around, and the eave was designed so that it would catch water and drain it down into a cistern that was underneath the building. Now, there's no fresh water anywhere on York Island that can be tapped into. So they figured that this would be a way of supplying everybody with water. So as we enter into this clearing, this is where we really get to the heart of what the fort was all about. Jennifer, all this to your left 200 meters. No water on the island. 200 meters high, and they were actually transporting brick. This is one of the most interesting structures here. It's the observation post. And if you're out on the water on the west side of the island and look up, you can see it really clearly from the water. So this is where they were signaling to the ships that were stopping people in Johnston Street because the Navy was here with their examination ships and they stopped everyone who was heading up or down the street. Uh, just to make sure that none of them were the enemy. And if all was okay, they would signal up to here and they would let them go by. The uh, fort was in under continual construction. They first started out with a couple of uh, what they call the 4.7 inch guns that were actually from the First World War. These were naval guns. And they figured that they had the ability to shoot at any aircraft or any boats that might be coming by, that is the enemy boats. Uh, now, once Pearl Harbor was attacked, they decided that they needed to upgrade to six inch guns and they built some very impressive gun emplacements at the top of the island. 
In addition to that, around the same time in December of 41, they put three substantial searchlight emplacements all around the island. In fact, people who lived across the way at Kelsey Bay said that they could read their newspapers by this light. It was so bright. And these lights were on 24 hours a day. Uh, the gun emplacements were were built um, about halfway through the war in about 1942-43. Up until that time, they simply put camouflage tarps over top of the guns. So this is really quite a masterpiece of engineering. And as you can see here, they still have the storage area where they put the shells, and it's that you can read shell recess on there. Now, inside where the, gun where the gun was, was actually situated, as you can see by the size of those bolts, it was quite a big piece of equipment. So this is where they stored all the ammo and all the explosives. The six inch guns that they used here, the naval guns, took shells about this big in diameter and they actually used them in practice. So these guys would spend hours in here. Um, a normal shift was four hours and they would spell each other off. I've heard anywhere from 200 men to 700 men. Uh, one character that I interviewed said there was barely a square foot for each man, and, and uh, certainly on a 130-acre island or 55-hectare island, uh, it's pretty hard to picture them squeezing that many men in there. Well, the local people were really quite amused by what was going on. Um, they were just astonished that so many ships and so much activity was happening around York Island because it was a little island that had never been occupied. of a sudden they were inundated with a couple hundred soldiers and construction workers and some local people were involved in, in the construction and then all of a sudden the war became very real to people okay if uh, you want to google uh, YouTube and Rather, go on YouTube and search York Island. York is with an E. You can find that video, seven minutes long, okay? Now, on this slide here, there was a threat, and it did happen. Um, on the 20th of June, 1942, this submarine, the I-26, surfaced, surfaced off Estevan Point Lighthouse, just north of Tofino, and fired 25 to 30 rounds of 5.5-inch shells in an attempt to destroy a radio direction-finding installation. Okay, this Imperial Japanese ship had sunk this ship, the coastal trader, on June the 7th, 13 days earlier, before it went up to Esteban Point. This submarine, I-21, was one of the deadliest in the, for the Japanese Navy. It had the third and highest score before it was sunk in the Philippines. It was in uh, 1944. It was an advanced submarine. This is an area here to store an aircraft. So it was one of their more advanced models. Now, as we move along, 18 March 1960, the Stanley Park Armory burned down. Irish Fusiliers, St. Patrick's Day, Thursday, having a few extra drinks. Somebody left a cigarette and a couch or something unknown. Building burned down. A fireman was hurt putting this out. It was all wood. You can see the ring in here where I can't all everything is collapsed. Okay. Just a couple of pictures of the armory in the early 80s. There were no classrooms up here. It was all open. The sliding door. Look at all the banks and windows. Three of them have been in. This is uh, uh, Major General Sue McDonald giving out a certificate for a, a summer uh, BMQ course. That's, uh, that's, it was SYT, but it was BMQ at that time. What? Right here where we are now, this is the junior ranks. No classrooms up there, and there's a staircase used to come out onto the parade square. It was, when we were doing uh, renovations, Next slide. Uh, when the Armory Parade Square was being um, renovated in 2009, they dug this up. It was a, a concrete pad, like an octagon eight side. On every straight side, it had a bar that had been cut off. It was for hitching horses when they were using them early back in the day when the unit first moved in. Uh, and they, they broke it up, it was right over there. Now, 
We're almost near the end here. I just want to talk a little bit about our honor shield. This is up on the wall. It has all our history from 68 batteries history that we just learned to where the three batteries served in the Second World War. That's it's Canadian uh, CASF, it's Canadian Army Service Force. Since then, the unit hasn't really deployed as a unit, but we sent soldiers in all these UN and NATO operations. We rotated soldiers from 2004 to 2013 in Afghanistan, and domestic operations off laser right now. That's a domestic operation, okay? So your history is right there. This was designed for you to bring in a guest or a soldier from another unit. They can stop on the parade square, read it for one minute, and get. Uh, a great sense of our history. That's the purpose of that. Around the armory, that's starting with that wall there and that gun, the 18-pounder, you go, the history of the unit progresses and you have all the guns that we had, the 4.5-inch converting to coast artillery, the 6-inch you saw at Stanley Park and up on York Island, the anti-aircraft units that we that merged, we had 155s in the late 60s, two of them. And then you come around here to the 25-pounder, the C1, and the C3 today. So your history is right here, right around the building, the ring. The other, that wall over there has all the units that were in this army that we perpetuate. The second bank from the left is 15 field. It goes down and then goes across. And you can just see all the transition from field artillery, the coast artillery, back to field artillery. Shout out now to all our support trade. There is no, we can't do anything without food, fuel, pay, vehicles that work and transportation. All right, the Royal Canadian Army Service Corps, uh, the Royal Canadian Army Pay Corps of the day. Very nice cap badge. Some of you were, may remember this, the admin branch that got disappeared and merged into this one today. So without our service work rate, there is no history. Uh, 15 Field Artillery Regiment has, distinguished, has a distinguished long and rich history and proud heritage. As we enter into our second century, St. Barbara, I didn't, I should have probably put St. Cecilia here for the band, but St. Barbara is the patron saint of the artillery, miners, engineers, and grenadiers. Uh, anyone who works with explosives, all right? Last slide. Uh, these are the gunners above the armory. If you have a, a chance to look out there, they're up there. Take a look up. See the horses pulling, pulling the, uh, likely the 18 pounders here. Are there uh, any questions? Questions at all about history? Remember, everything for the last 20 years we've built out onto this parade square. See Captain Moe's history, it's all here. The story's right there. Look at, it's right around you, surrounding you every day. It's right outside the building. Any questions here on the floor? Uh, any questions? Uh, we'll turn it over to the band if they have any questions from home. Uh, go ahead, come on here. Uh, since we still have the spotlights and everything, we're still out there with Sally Park, would it be possible one day that actually come out there and did we get a look at some of these things? The searchlights at Stanley Park? Uh, yeah, the stuff that is still out there, but I think that there is still stuff out there. There is, like uh, the ones on uh, Tower Beach, the two searchlights down there, and the one at, at Stanley Park near um, Siwash Rock. You can walk up to them. The searchlights have been removed. They're all locked up. They're like a shell and they're rusted. Um, there has been efforts in the past. Uh, our old former curator had a chance to go underneath where the two guns were at Ferguson Point. It's flooded. So they're basically locked up. Um, you know, access could be looked into in the future, but basically they're they're locked up and they're unfortunately they're decaying and they're being repeated all over the place as well. But uh, that could be looked into and it has happened. Uh, we do we have gone to um, the Point Grey battery. Is that a tour underneath it? See the gun in the the gun placement in the museum itself. We've gone up to York Island. We sent two groups up there. That's 2014, 2016. We've uh, um, We've stopped, uh, we've even stopped the guns on a cannon state salute and looked at the, the gun emplacements at Ferguson Point. So, yeah, there is lots of uh, more than all the gun emplacements as well in the lower mainland. Any other questions? Questions? No? Uh, sir? So, I just want to say thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, so, last night, uh, we put this on for the groups that were here. Uh, a couple of points that, that by all means, number one gun places at Point Grey is in the new story years ago. It's still very interesting to have a look at that uh, in the beginning of the uh, There is still some remnants of the park down the sea, down the sea, a little further over, although I haven't seen them in years. Uh, and uh, I just want to point out something that the French Council said. The history of 